Nick, I'm going to wait and let you get in. Yep. Awesome. Thanks. You're good. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Nick Fatalbo. Actually, Amanda, are you going to introduce me? Sorry. I, I was, I, I was, but that. whatever. Go for it. You go for it. <laughs> so for those of you that don't know, I'm Amanda Wheeler. Um, I handle marketing and applied ballistics, mobile lab deployment for applied ballistics. Um, we've been doing these monthly um, Zoom sessions uh, this year to help educate and answer questions and grow the sport. So um, today we have Nick Vitalbo, and I'm going to let him introduce himself and let him tell you what he does for Applied Ballistics. Well, well thanks, Amanda. I appreciate it. You could tell how eager I was to have this presentation. I was just so excited. I, I completely cut you off. I certainly That's didn't okay. mean to do so. Um, but uh, obviously, I'm Nick. My role here at Applied Ballistics, you know, it's kind of interesting. The team is almost completely different in terms of our skill sets and disciplines in terms of backgrounds uh, from Michigan to what I'll call the Ohio division here. So in Ohio, we have a number of engineers. Uh, we're mostly software electronics guys. Our background is really in fire control. We've been doing it for a long period of time. And I'll, I'll start off with a little bit about my background, maybe just so you guys can know where I'm coming from with a lot of this stuff. And, and talk about the team a little bit. But to talk about how, I don't know, different we are in terms of organization, or really one organization, but it's a little different in the work we do. It's kind of funny. I'm sure that a lot of you have seen the introduction videos, like I am Brian Litz and I am Applied Ballistics videos and things of that nature. And Amanda came down with the film crew uh, back over the winter time here and we could not fill up an entire minute and a half of anything interesting that we do because a bunch of people sitting in front of their computers is not really fun to watch for a period of like more than about a minute, but that's essentially what we do. We're, we're engineers. We spend a lot of time in front of the computers doing a lot of the design work and such. Uh, almost any of the laser range finders or software that have the applied ballistics name attached to it has gone through our team in, uh, in some way, shape or form over the past several years. Um, and today, uh, I wanted to talk about a few things. Uh, number one is uh, what is fire control, number one. Uh, number two is a little bit of the thinking that goes into when we design and architect a product, some of the things that we think through and how we consider the software to operate. It may give you insight into how some of the other software also works on your devices. And it, I think that's valuable to understand where our mindset is at at times. And uh, then I would like to open it up to questions. Throughout the duration of this, I probably will pick up a few devices that I have here next to me, talk about each one of them, uh, what their capabilities are, and make sure that if there are any questions on those devices that they get answered throughout the, the question or the time period here. So I'll try to keep uh, my talking to about a half an hour or so. I'll open it up for about 15, 20 minutes worth of questions and we'll make sure that we end before the hour is up. And hopefully this will uh, go really well. So first off, my background, I, I think I've, I've introduced myself a few times and I've been on a lot of different podcasts with uh, Precision Rifle Media and such, but uh, my background is really something much different than the rest of the groups. It's in how laser beams propagate through the atmosphere, which sounds completely different than probably anything ballistically related, but it helps to understand where we're coming from sometimes. So. Back in about 2003, I started working for Lockheed Martin, and I started doing a lot of work with infrared countermeasures, heat-seeking missiles, and jamming them and such. But really, what that led into was another area of study, which was optical communications through free space. And in that case, what was unique about that is that we were using lasers basically to communicate long distance. Um, sorry about the, uh, the noise here. Amazon just pulled up into the, uh, the background over here. But we were using lasers to communicate long range from basically plane to plane and plane to ground station and such. And um, hey, guys, I'm going to pause this for just 30 seconds here and just make sure that uh, the Amazon truck isn't too loud. Can you guys hear me okay? Okay, we're good. Hold on one second. <laughs> All right, I'm just going to keep talking. We'll just use it as room music in the background here. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, 
So moving from uh, the optical communications, one of the things that we noticed was that as the laser beam propagates through the atmosphere, you see scintillation. Uh, basically that is speckles formed in a laser pattern based upon the turbulence that's being driven across the path. Um, and from there, uh, we determined that you could actually make a wind speed. So the natural application for measuring the wind is obviously in the fire control space or uh, in, the, in the world of um, uh, basically ballistics. So uh, from there, hold on guys, I am gonna take a, like a 30 second break here. It's so loud here, I came to hear myself talk. So I apologize sincerely about this. Oh, of course they're delivered now. So it's at the, um, they're pulling away here. So I'll just give it like about 10 more seconds. Well, no matter how many times you rehearse these things, it's always kind of fun. So obviously the um, introduction of wind speed and crosswind measurement here was extremely important to the ballistics world. And that's something we spent a lot of time on. We're still doing a lot of research and development in that area. But the obvious other areas is laser range finding, integration of ballistics into devices and such. And I always joke, it's kind of funny because I didn't grow up shooting. I kind of make fun of myself a little bit in that I wrote my first ballistic solver prior to ever shooting a gun. But the cool thing about that was that I understood the math, all the physics and everything like that behind shooting prior to ever having to, uh, to actually shoot. So I, it was pretty natural then to get behind a weapon and to be able to engage targets pretty easily and readily. And so I spent a lot of my time also teaching ballistics and whatnot. And uh, that's pretty much the same background to a lot of the guys here in Ohio. Our background is primarily uh, in engineering. We do a lot of the work in there, uh, all the devices and such. And, and a lot of the guys did come from Lockheed Martin, came from similar backgrounds. Uh, we broke out in about the 2011 timeframe and then uh, partnered up with Applied Ballistics in 2012. So we've been at this now about a decade. So fire control, what does that mean? All right, moving into the meat of the, the conversation here today. So fire control is really to me and a lot of other people more than just a ballistic solver. And especially the team in Ohio here views ballistics as more than just, you know, what is a ballistic solver? So for instance, our idea of what fire control entails is everything from the weapon system itself, the ammunition, of course, the bullet, the sighting system, you know, the, the rifle scope, the laser range finder or something to detect the target, identify the range of target, sample what the atmospherics are. And then also in addition to that, to, uh, to make the ballistic calculation and then ultimately take the shot based upon all of the data you've collected from each one of those systems. And so if you look at all of those four or five levels of uh, fire control there, what you'll see is that the Michigan team focuses a lot on what is the science of the ballistics? How do you, you know, make sure that you take the right measurements? How do you uh, do the actual calculations? They spend a tremendous amount of time making sure that the, the weapon system design, the bullet design and everything is characterized well and, and well implemented there. The Ohio team really takes all of that work then that they're doing and embeds it within specific applications. And so that's where we come into play with the design and development of the laser range finders, of rifle scopes and things of that nature. And we take all of that and make it into a reality of the software that you eventually use that resides in any of these uh, pieces of hardware devices. And so fire control consists of all of those things. And looking at them, when we design a lot of our software, so as I'm going through things today, I'm gonna to kind of be referencing Applied Ballistics Analytics, the Windows PC application. It's a good teaching tool, and that's normally where I teach from, actually. Um, if you look at it, just the user interface itself, it's broken out, and we try to do this consistently across all of the applications as much as possible. It's broken out into a couple of things. What the bullet properties are, what the gun and scope properties are, what the target parameters are, and ultimately what the environmental parameters are. And there are ways to get all of that information accurately. And then ultimately all that data comes into the ballistics processor, computes a solution, and then drives the sighting system. And so let's take it one step at a time here. So 
let's look at the bullets. Um, the guys up in Michigan focus primarily on, you know, I'm sure a lot of you have shot over the radar system. Um, the radar system, what it does is it tracks the uh, velocity of the round as it goes down range. And from that, you can get a very accurate measurement if you know the temperature, pressure, humidity and such of what the actual drag on the bullet was as a function of its velocity. And that goes into making all of the custom drag models and the personal drag models. What happens from there, uh, we take all of that data, we push it up to a cloud-based server that we house all of that data in. And every time one of the phone applications connects or you open it up, it does a check to see if the new bullet database is available. So that, Number one, how we control, how we really maintain fire control on our side is the very first thing is we want to make sure we have accurate bullet data. And that's exactly what we're doing here and what I just described. The next thing is the gun and scope data, basically. So that's making sure that you've got everything from your twist rate set correctly to making sure that your scope tracks correctly. I know that the guys talk a lot about sight scale factors, making sure your level and everything like that. That's a makes a tremendous difference, especially in ELR type shooting where everything has to track perfectly when you're dialing up tremendous holds and such. Um, from there, also making sure that you have accurate range measurements of what the zero range and things of that nature are. Um, and your sight height measurement, of course, also. So that, that encompasses that. Most of that data you can gather yourself pretty easily, obviously, or it's set within your weapon system. And so that's not a problem at all. Um, the two other parameters, though, that you need for fire control, target data and environmental data, typically require some level of a tool to do that. So let's talk for a little bit about the target data. Um, you know, that encompasses the range, the heading, the inclination, uh, latitude, and so on and so forth. So I've got a few devices here that I wanted to bring up and show you. Give me a second here. All right, we'll start off with one of the first generations of devices actually that we started implementing ballistics into was the Kilo uh, 2400 ABS. And that particular device uh, was really our first uh, fire control system that had a, an integrated laser range finder. We did that with uh, Sig Sauer and it had the full applied ballistics elite capability into, built into it. And that had a really, really good following. In fact, we still you know, produce a, a fair number of those every month. Uh, it's surprising because a lot of that technology was implemented back in like the 2015 kind of time frame. So it was kind of interesting to now look back and like five years ago, think of how far we've come since then. But that particular device uh, led into a lot of other devices such as the the BDX line of products. So here you can see this is the, the Kilo 2200. Uh, the Kilo 2400 ABS really came out of the market. It did everything. It had temperature, pressure, humidity sensors, a compass, an inclinometer, range measurement, obviously, and then link backs to the, the bullet database and everything that we talked about. The interesting part about this, though, is that we wanted to make sure that from a hunting perspective, we were being ethical. And so this range capability from a ballistic standpoint was limited to 800 yards or meters in order to make sure that it was used primarily for hunting. That also allowed us to get the cost primarily down as well. Uh, and then the Kilo 2400 and 3000 BDX devices can get solutions from either your Garmin or your Kestrel devices as well. So that's the reason why those were kind of done. Um, and that was with the uh, implementation of Bluetooth Low Energy that a lot of those new capabilities were opened up. Um, after that time frame. We, we continue to move on to some other products uh, in development. Uh, this was, or is, the Bushnell Nitro 1800. This is a device that came out about uh, two, two and a half years ago, maybe. And so this device, and kind of unique, what it does is it allows you to start off with the Applied Ballistics Ultralight License, which is the 1800, or 800 yard limit, I'm sorry, and then work your way up to uh, if you want to, you can purchase an elite level license, which gets you a little bit higher performance. It does not have things like compasses and whatnot. The reason why, by the way, that we don't always implement compasses in devices is because, as you've probably learned from using your Kestrel, digital magnetic compasses are 
really bad. And it takes a fair amount of software and electronics to really make a good one. Um, that's really kind of a, a, an interesting conversation. We have an entire program on the government side dedicated to doing nothing but north finding study, believe it or not. And it's, it's kind of a complicated thing to deal with. Uh, in the indirect fire case where we're talking about grenades and mortars, and looking at extremely long distances, that becomes increasingly important. Uh, for small arms cases, it's not that big of a deal and that's more of a direct fire kind of case. Um, so it's just kind of uh, kind of funny how, how you look at those things and having to predict what the, or not predict, but how to measure north to within a degree is really, really difficult, um, especially when you're in the presence of other uh, magnetic interferences and such. But, We've continued to put those in and work around a lot of those issues. So for instance, here you go is the um, 35,000 HD. This particular device by Vortex was, is one of the newest devices we've released. It has everything built into it, including a compass, temperature, pressure, humidity, everything like that in here, as well as the Bluetooth Fire Energy, which by the way, the other devices have there too. Um, the cool thing about it is it does take all of those measurements for you. What's awesome about that is that it's more of like just a, a single point and click shoot and then kind of situation where you don't have to worry as much about uh, grabbing all the environmentals and such. Um, but this really, all of these devices I've shown you really focus on taking all of that target data from the fire controls you know, situation that I discussed here and populating that automatically for you basically. And that's, that's their focus. Now, each one of these devices has a ballistics computer inside of it. Um, but in addition to that, they can use outside sources of ballistics computations. And so that's where I wanted to talk about the final component of uh, fire control, basically, the environmental data. So let's take a look at some of the other devices out there now. <clears throat> Two of them in particular, you can see in one screenshot here, um, the Kestrel 5700 AB, as well as the Garmin Tactics Delta. AB. Um, both are pretty awesome devices. Um, from a measurement of environmental standpoint, the Kestrel really shines. You have temperature, pressure, humidity, wind speed, wind direction, all built in and encompassed within a single device. I'm sure that like this is probably the most familiar thing to you. Um, and I mean, one thing that never ever leaves my wrist, for instance, is the, the Garmin uh, Tactics Delta Solar Watch with AB. It's, it's not only a great ballistics calculator and such, but it's really an awesome device to have. I mean, pretty much track everything I do. And I spend a lot of time outside, outside doing hiking and uh, you know, running around in the backwoods and stuff like that. So it's really a nice device to have for that stuff. But what is you know, super you know, interesting is these devices can get you very accurate temperature, pressure, humidity. In the Garmin case, you have to use like an external device like the Tempe uh, temperature sensor, which is a, a connected device to your watch. Um, uses a protocol called AMP Plus to actually talk back, uh, back and forth. But once you take all of that data and aggregate all of that together, so everything from the bullet data that we talked about from your custom drag models, PDMs, your gun and scope information, your target data, and then finally your environmental data, now you have to actually use that, how you use it. Well, a lot of the devices take all that in and you know, based upon what you've entered, automatically produce a ballistic solution for you uh, that you can then apply to your rifle scope. Now, the sighting system is extremely important. Uh, in fact, if you go back to one of Brian's, I think it was maybe his first book actually, and it may be the second one, but one of the things that he talked about, like what are the components of shooting? Well, you need a gun, bullet, and you know your ammunition, but then you need to apply this to a sighting system. And that's where uh, all of this aggregates together to give you ultimately how much you have to hold up and down, how much you have to hold left and right. And you'll see a lot of the advancement in technology now putting that into the rifle scope itself. So there has a, been a push actually since the like 2012, actually, yeah, I'll go back further even than that. If you go look at the original DARPA one-shot program back in like the 2008 timeframe when we were doing this stuff back at Lockheed Martin, we actually implemented the very first heads-up display uh, inside of a rifle scope that I'm aware of at least. And this was done with a Premier Reticles rifle scope actually. We drove a, a full heads-up display inside of that thing. It took the, the you know, the um, ballistics calculations from the one-shot main system, beamed it over, 
either wirelessly or over wired connection to the rifle scope itself and then it went from there. Uh, and so that was a really expensive device though. So we focused really on making that low cost. And so there's a couple of devices I have here that then you can, you can see how this evolution of uh, price has come down and how you take all that data, data, aggregate it, and then push it into a rifle scope. So I got two examples here. Uh, you might be familiar with this one. This is uh, the six hour uh, Sierra set of rifle scopes here. This is a Sierra three, um, six and a half to 20 by 52. What's cool is that there's two different modes of operation here. You can set it up just to use the site itself and set up your own BDC. You take all of the data from your bullet, your gun and everything like that entered into the application and then drive a ballistically compensated reticle into the device. Or if you pair it with a laser range finder, every time you then range a device or range a target, the laser range finder device itself collects the data, beams that solution over to here. And I think that what you'll see is that over the next several years, you're going to see an increase in the number of devices that operate like that. Uh, you'll also see a continued increase in the optical quality as well as the range performance and such. So you'll see a continued evolution of that stuff over time. And one of the very natural applications for that is also in thermal weapon sites. So here I've got an Echo 3. Uh, because you have a full digital display that you can put information into, putting all of that fire control data into a device like this makes perfect sense. And being able to range a target, get the data, drive a solution directly into here. So that's really where I see things going. So from a uh, fire control system standpoint, I think I'll keep reiterating it just so that it's clear, but it's the bullet data, the gun, the scope, the target, the environmental, and ultimately putting that you know, bullet on target there. Um, and that's how we see all that stuff coming together. So I've shown you a number of devices here. And I want to talk, though, about where I continue to see things going um, within not only applied ballistics, but the industry as a whole. Um, and I also want to come back and talk through some of the softwares, for instance, that you'll see coming out here. Um, so let's take a look at where rangefinders are going. Uh, you'll see uh, I've probably talked uh, way too many times on the topic of laser rangefinding but you'll see an inc a dramatic increase in the performance of laser rangefinders uh, coming up here over the next several years, I'd say. Uh, one of the, the says the host muted me. You are muted. Can you guys hear me okay? Thumbs up Amanda. Yes, I'm sorry, that was my fault. My That's bad. Okay. Sorry. She thought I was talking too long. She tried to smack me down. She's like, five more minutes, Nick. That's what she said. She texted me that. I'm just kidding. It wasn't that bad. Um, but you'll see an increase in performance. Uh, so a couple of things uh, on the laser range finding side. You have a fundamental limit of how much energy you can put out of a device while still maintaining eye safety limits. So what you'll see is over time here, You'll see a growth in the aperture size. You'll see a growth in uh, like to make sure that you're collecting more light. You'll see that we're shrinking the beam divergence, but also increasing the aperture over which the, the light goes out. So for example, these are the Kilo 3000s, but if you try to transmit <clears throat> a fixed amount of output light from a, an aperture this size versus an aperture this size, what you'll notice is that the light is spread out over a greater area here, making it much safer for uh, your eyes, basically. Um, so there's two things to consider in eye safety, like what's the average power output, what's the, um, you know, the pulse laser energy, and then in addition to that, over what area that spread. So what you wind up with is uh, a nominal ocular hazard distance. And usually that classifies also a laser into like a class one, class three, class three B and so on and so forth. Uh, we try to make sure that as many devices as possible are maintaining class one, um, but you will see as time goes on here, increasing the size uh, of the devices, apertures, uh, power output, we're pretty much maxed out on that. 
but you'll also notice that the range performance due to the sensitivity also of chips and whatnot, like the detectors have um, become significantly better. So you'll see a lot of that uh, coming up here. Um, the other thing that you'll see is the continued integration of devices will continue to go up. So as I'm sure you're familiar with everything nowadays connected to everything else in your home, in your car and everything like that, we're continuing to push that envelope on the side of the uh, sport optics world. And so I think you'll continue to see more data driven out of the laser range finders directly into rifle scopes and to other devices from a shooting perspective uh, to make sure that you can get the, you know, the easiest projection into your rifle scope basically as possible. Um, some of the challenges that we face there is making sure that the optical quality is not compromised. That's a, a huge challenge. M making sure that it can be bright enough so that you can see through it in the day scene. And then, sorry, there's some, I basically sit outside by the way, um, for most of the day. So there's some flies flying around here. Uh, basically make sure it's bright enough so you can see that uh, projection during the day while still maintaining enough light coming in so that the optical quality is good. So. That's, that's one of the big differences uh, you'll see coming up here is an increase in the ability to display data. Um, and then the third thing I really see is the, the geospatial awareness of things. One of the major pushes that we've done recently on the military side is uh, how we work and integrate with ATAC and, and other um, devices like their softwares like that, that allow you know, recognition of where targets at, uh, geospatially mapped and things of that nature. Uh, we also do a tremendous amount of work on the indirect fire case as well. Can't get into a lot of those details, obviously, in a public forum, but you'll continue to see a lot of the small arm size here, uh, stuff going on. So uh, that's kind of where I see things going. Um, I'm right about at the half an hour mark here, so I want to touch on just a few things. Um, what you will see overall here is throughout all of our software, you've got um, you know, it implemented on five or six different devices that you see here, a lot of different phone applications and whatnot. And what you can do with that, basically, if you look at how we've architected, almost everything is broken down into the same components that I talked about. The bullet properties, the gun and scope, the target, the environmental, and then ultimately how to project that into some fire control, or how to project that into a site. That encompasses fire control, um, and you'll continue to see a, a series of innovations along those ways and, and kind of focusing on each one of those. We really try to be the leader in the bullet world. Um, I mean, the guys up in Michigan do a tremendous job. I think from the commercial side, just being able to measure like the bullets as they go down range with the Doppler system is just incredible. We've really sped up the process. We've taken, concert, taken a concerted effort over this past several months here to really make sure that the guys, that, shoot over in girls that shoot over the radar system um, definitely get their PDMs as fast as possible uh, and that'll just continue to be improved and then obviously um, how your devices range finders and such integrate with different pieces of hardware is going to continue to increase too so um, with that being said I kind of wanted to give you just the background on, on fire control maybe what we do how we think about things uh, and I want to ask uh, if there are any, some specific questions. I thought I saw Mike's question kind of pop up. It was so fast, I didn't get a chance to actually actually read it. So um, let me see if I can open up my chat window here. Sure, I can just read it to you. Stuff. Sure. It says, do you think that the laser performance increases will be gradual enough where if you buy today, you don't feel like, <laughs> oh, shucks. <laughs> I should have waited two more months. Um, I've been in the quandary for a while. I want or need a new LRF upgrade. However, I've been dragging my feet trying to avoid buyer's remorse. Yeah, um, this is a, a hard one. So for those of you that may not be in the computer space, there's a thing called Moore's Law. It basically says that every 18 months, the ability for computers to well, actually the number of transistors in a given processor will, um, will double. And I kind of see a lot of that, maybe not exactly applying 100% to Moore's Law, 
but a lot of those same and similar things going on. So you will continue to see increased performance over time. Now, there are some fundamental limits that you're going to reach. Like I talked about, how much energy you can put out is capped by eye safety limits. How big the apertures are is going to be what people can tolerate from the standpoint of actually physically hand, you know, hand holding a device. Um, and then the other thing you can kind of control is how many pulses you put out over time. So you'll see a lot of devices now have what's known as like an ELR mode, which is basically putting more um, energy out um, over a greater period of time, increasing the number of samples that are taken. And from there, you can increase your signal to noise ratio, which gives you greater performance. Now, here's one of the interesting things that I talk about in some of the laser rangefinder talks that really not that well known unless you're really getting into the design features of some of these things. But um, once from a rangefinder perspective, one of the things that you can do to improve the performance of your rangefinder, especially in ELR, ELR world, is if you have a cooperative target, what I mean by cooperative is something you're controlling the target. If you're not trying to hit a deer, an animal, or something like that, if you're trying to instead just hit a, a plain target out there in the middle of space, using reflective tape can dramatically increase how much light is returned. So that is one of the things that I regularly guide people to. If you look on um, online, if you go to Lowe's or Home Depot, the reflective mailbox um, type of prismatic design is really what is uh, utilized and the best for that. So like you can put you know, a couple of strips like that out on a target, it's going to dramatically increase your signal noise ratio and as a result, you can range farther. So you can even take a low cost device then and, and turn the performance up basically by using it in those kind of modes. Now, there are some fundamental limitations though, and this is kind of an interesting one that nobody really thinks about. When you've got a laser range finder, there's a specific amount of memory in that device, okay? So what happens is, is as you range a target, you start a counter and you have to bin the data coming back. So you look at like, okay, you sample the detector, every, let's just say quarter nanosecond or something like that. So if you're looking for only like, I don't know, a half of a, like call it a hundred milliseconds worth of time, that's gonna limit basically what your, your upper cap is on how far that light can travel during that time period. And that is usually based upon how much memory is physically in the device. So you'll notice, and it, it's not as apparent anymore, but, a lot of the range finders nowadays are spec'd at, you know, it's a Fury 5000, for instance. And there's a reason for that because that was the limitation on the physical memory size inside of there. So that, that's how far we could range with that device given the, the memory constraints and such. Now you might say, okay, let's just make it infinite, right? And, well, number one, there's a cost component to that. Uh, and FPGAs go up uh, significantly in cost, like the fast processors inside as, as, as uh, their size goes up. And number two, you start to incorporate noise from a whole bunch of other stuff like, you know, trees and sun and everything like that. So, but do know that that's the kind of stuff that uh, you can do. Number one, the glint tape stuff. Number two, you can increase, um, you know, look at where the max device capabilities reside. Um, and, and that should give you an idea what the, the memory allocation is inside of there. And so hopefully, Mike, to, to kind of get to your exact question, uh, I don't know that you'll have buyer's remorse, but um, it, you know there is going to be a period of time where things will continue to evolve very quickly, I would say, and it's gonna be hard to keep up. So find a device that works well for you in your hunting or your shooting situation and uh, really you know maximize its capability. So that's kind of all I can say there, so. One other piece of advice to that from Mike is don't purchase anything until right after the first of the year when SHOT Show happens. <laughs> because all the, a lot of the new stuff starts to pop out around SHOT Show time. Yeah. See. Yeah, I'd say twice during a year at least. There's usually uh, three times, you know, from a business standpoint, so you guys are aware. Uh, it really didn't happen this year too much, but the, uh, the NRA show, um, it's the, the, yeah, the NRA show, which is what, like May time frame usually? There's a uh, safari show right before September. Okay. Um, and this and like there's a fall release. Gotcha. 
there's a fall release right before hunting season. And then there's usually the shot show slash safari show, like release of products and such. So, um, so, okay, I've got a question from DK. I've, I heard you say some of your data resides in the cloud. If you consider integrations or applications leverage machine learning to crunch the bullet trajectory data to gather insights. If yes, has there been any interesting findings? Um, so we're, the, I guess the short answer is yeah. In fact, the guys up in Michigan have done a tremendous amount of that lately. Brian in particular has been doing a lot of that. Um, I won't call it AI or machine learning, but he's been looking at a lot of, as you collect large statistical samples of the data, what kind of information can you glean from that? And I don't want to take away too much of his um, uh, work that's going on there and, and bastardize it basically, because I will definitely not get it right. But there is a tremendous amount of information that he's looking to publish here in the very short time period coming up that has to do with how muzzle velocity migration works, um, how, twist rate affects your ballistic coefficient and the trajectory of the round. Uh, and a lot of that is based upon just a tremendous amount of live fire data. Um, and we're, he's learning, a, well, not he, but all of us are learning a ton of information from that. What we'll do, by the way, is from all of that information, once Brian you know, kind of takes it, analyzes it, gets it into some analytical form that can be used, we, we take a lot of that stuff and we apply it directly to the ballistic solver itself. And so as you can imagine, you'll continue to see ballistic solver uh, performance increases over a period of time, just because we're now able to measure some of these, you know, second, third, fourth order effects that we weren't previously able to do. Uh, so, so yeah, short answer is yes. Uh, from a cloud integration standpoint, um, we don't save a lot of the trajectory information, primarily because we compute it. Um, also, we want to respect your privacy rights and such, so we don't like collect statistics on you or what you're shooting or how far or something like that. So, kind of worried about that. Um, okay, looking down through the uh, the stuff here. Oh, my buddy Marco. Hey, shout out to you. Uh, you can ask me the raptor question anytime. He has a question about the raptor, but he said it's too long to write, so you can ask me anytime. Yeah. yeah. Hey. Ask yeah. There he is. Hey. Hey. I'm on hey. hey, Nick. How's it going? Awesome, man. It's good uh, to see you. Great seeing you, man. Hey, by the way, great tan, man. <laughs> oh, thanks. I appreciate it. I spent a little time outside. I bet. I bet. One quick question on the Raptor. We, we yeah. mount the Raptor at 12 o'clock on the scope. Okay. Uh, we normally zero the Raptor like a two miles on top of the radical, the center of the radical, because the flood is so powerful that most of the time I cannot even see the target because the, the flood is very strong. And this is one of the advantage. The other one, I was thinking probably could be better to have like a, a parallel zero between the raptor and the scope and the center of the radical, like a, like a two mils eye or something like that, instead of like a red instruction, like a having a, the, the laser uh, go in, uh, going in the center of the radical. That will give yeah. me, because also otherwise the laser will, will go this way, will meet the center of the radical, and probably will we'll pass the center of the radical a long distance, and then it will be at the bottom of the center of the radical. So yeah. in order to, to have a precise point where I can put the, the laser on top and, and have a good reading of the target, is it a good idea or something? Or the flood of the laser will be already too big to cover much of the radical? Yeah, that's actually, that's a perfect question. In fact, um, that's one that I think is going to be vitally important to the commercial world uh, in the near future. So uh, it's gonna apply the same way as Raptor. So what I teach, especially on the Raptor side when I do this work is that we put a reflective sign out at something like at least 800 meters, okay? And 800 isn't a special number, but what that is is it's considered to be optical infinity, okay? From your rifle scope's perspective, as well as from the laser's perspective. But if you put it out at a thousand or something like that, it'll work too. I typically use the red laser. So all of the lasers in the Raptor and almost any other weapon mounted device are all co-aligned to be you know, exactly at infinity. Um, all, they all go out straight. They don't cross like you're talking about. So, that's, so to make sure that you don't cross like the rifle scope aiming here, the laser kind of pointed down and then they cross and diverge after some period of time. What I do is I set a reflective target out at a thousand 
Okay, I look at the, the red laser itself, so you can see it in the bright daylight when you're on the target, okay? And that beam should be somewhere on the order of about this big, okay? Now, you, it might be maybe like that, but you might be able to see it like about a foot or two. Um, now, what I'll try to do then is move the crosshairs of, or move that red laser directly to the crosshairs of the rifle scope using the elevation and windage dials on the Raptor itself. Now, it's hard to get it perfect because it is a click detent kind of situation with the Raptor, um, but just get it as physically close as possible. I think each one of those detents is 0.05 mils. So you should be able to get it to within like half the width of what your reticle is at least. Um, and, and that's what I'd recommend. If you do it at a thousand, you know, the separate, the physical separation between the center of your rifle scope and the Raptor itself is maybe like this, but that, basically comes out you know at a wash at a thousand meters basically so um, you know you won't be able to refine that pointing of the laser any more than that so that's that's how i'd recommend it do the 12 o'clock that's by far the best position has the best boresight retention um, i do it in the day because i don't have nods and fancy uh, night vision gear uh, and i use the red laser with that reflective target so that's the way to do it got it thanks man yeah, anytime. It's good to see you. Talk soon. All right, the next question is from Daryl. Are current laser devices able to determine crosswind speed as a function of distance and enter that automatically into a ballistics solution? Sure, it depends on the technology. So there are two fundamental ways of doing the uh, crosswind speed detection. There is the method in which the Trigicon Ventus device works. I'm sure you guys are familiar with that. Uh, came out like last year. I haven't seen any actually in production, but hopefully they're continuing to work on that. Uh, the way it works is that it, it puts laser light out there. It scatters off of the aerosols within the atmosphere at a, I don't want to say a fixed distance, but shines a laser out there and looks for a certain period of time at these things, at that uh, distance. From there, it looks to see what the wavelength shift is. Now, you have to kind of do something a little bit unique in that case. You, you can't make a direct crosswind measurement. You have to like take a measurement here, take a measurement there, and infer what the crosswind is. It's just trigonometry, but it's how wide your angle is basically is gonna determine some of the accuracy measurements of what your, your wind speed can do. Um, your crosswind speed can be calculated. Now that Doppler system, it's called Doppler because it's looking at the shift in the wavelength as, as it goes, is basically uh, taking it at some discrete measurements. So, you know, 100, 200, 300, 400, 500. I think on that particular device, you can even set what those range gates are. Um, as you get out to something like 500 yards though, you're fundamentally limited in how much signal you can get back. And that's going to limit your overall performance of the device. Um, or like basically of the wind. Now, I suspect that there will be ways to take that, Bluetooth it into something else and automatically drive that ballistic solution um, for you. Now, the second way of doing it is scintillation based. This stuff's been around since even before I was born, but it's, and it's been actually proven to work really well over long periods of time and such. Um, some of the first experiments were done in like the 1973, 1974 era. Um, now we're taking it reducing it in size and making it into a package that can actually be, you know, utilized uh, and carried physically. Um, I kind of joke with uh, one of the guys that was early on involved. He made me carry the old DARPA one shot uh, device around like Todd Hodnett's wind course. And it weighed like, you know, something like 30 pounds, including the tripod. I didn't want to carry that anymore. But the way that the scintillation based systems work is that they particularly use some of the principles of adaptive optics. And what that is, is like how you look at the stars basically. So if you think about how a star twinkles, for example, the rate at which it twinkles and the depth of the modulation of the signal is directly related to what the average crosswind speed is. Uh, you can't make discrete measurements at fixed distances, but what you're doing is getting the average crosswind speed across the path of light from that star to your eye, if you can sample that light. Um, so what we do in a lot of situations on the scintillation based systems is you, you take a laser, you shine it on the target. You can go farther distances because you're not scattering out in the atmosphere, you're scattering off target. And what you can do from there is look at the return light from there and deduce what the average crosswind measurement is. Now, 
it's a little bit difficult because it's a stochastic process and we have to take large samples of data. Um, and it's a little bit uncomfortable knowing that you're basically guessing at your best estimate of what the wind speed is because it's not a direct measurement. It's an indirect measurement that you're making there. Um, not like, you know, for instance, on a Kestrel, when you have a wind that's producing a um, impeller to be driven and you're measuring the rate at which that impeller is driven, that's more of a direct measurement. In this case, we're looking at some of the statistics of that information. But each one of those systems has its, its pros and cons. Um, and I hope to see a lot more of those systems out there. I think uh, five years ago, I wrote in Modern Advancements that I think in five years that uh, those systems will be out there. And that was like when the Trigicon one like was announced. So it was like kind of spot on. I haven't seen many in production yet, um, but I do know that they are out there and being developed. And uh, we're kind of, we're not kind of, but we're actively working that stuff. So hopefully that answers that question. Are you looking for the next question? What's that? Are you looking for the next question? Yeah. Um, I'm having some issues with the connection, or more exact, the loss of a connection in between a Kestrel and the Kilo 3000, especially it seems to go to sleep and does not wake. Hey, Mike, actually, we found what the issue is. Um, super good. Well, not good that it actually happened, but we did find that issue. I think we were one or two users uh, that experienced this issue, especially it was noticed when you were on the target card as well as uh, like on the Kestrel and on the HUD. Um, otherwise it could occur on the, you know, if you're just on the main solution screen, but the good news is we found that, we identified it, we fixed it. Uh, that was about three, maybe four-ish weeks ago. The fixes in beta testing, I believe actually today was the day that they wanted to say, okay, we've, we've, we've verified that all those solutions are working and I expect the next test for release to happen very shortly. So um, the good news is we found that, fixed it, addressed that. So uh, don't be afraid, by the way, if you guys see issues like that, you can imagine with how many devices are out there and how many users we have, there's a plethora of issues that come up. Don't be afraid to email us, shoot us a, a text or whatever. Bring those to our attention because that's really, you know, one of our main focuses is making sure that if there is an issue out there, we resolve it as quickly as possible. So thanks for bringing that up. And yeah, we found it, fixed it. Um, speaking of which, um, I'll say it early and often, but um, without you guys completely like testing the products and such, like and making sure that that stuff gets fed back to us, like the products wouldn't be where they are today. So we really thank you for all of that. That's really helpful for us. So please don't feel like you're gonna offend us or anything like that. Um, I'm a little bit of a, a whiner. I may whine a little bit if you uh, bring something to me, but um, I promise you it's a very valuable thing. Uh, speaking of which, a couple of things I wanna talk about also is we're bringing the cloud sync back um, very soon here. I'm gonna make a lot of people happy. One of the reasons, by the way, just so you guys can kind of see, it's not like we ignored it for a while or anything like that, but when we went to the mobile lab with all the CDMs and PDMs, we really needed to do an entire backend infrastructure upgrade on the cloud sync and everything like that. So that's been a focus of ours. Uh, that's now be basically being tested. Um, we're in fact doing some uh, testing this morning on making sure that like once we get a couple thousand or hundred thousand users that things aren't gonna break when we increase the load on stuff like that but that's all coming out here in the very near future. And so we're gonna roll that into AB Mobile stuff first, and then I'm sure that it'll start to get pushed out into other applications over a period of time as well. All right, we got any more questions, Amanda? Um, well, I, D David, Lou, can you come off and ask your question? I'm not sure if this is something Nick can really address. What's that? I've got Mike's other question, by the way, about twist rates. I can talk to him for a minute if, if he needs help. Okay. Um, David, David Liu is asking about any new developments in Brimfire 22 precision long range shooting. Oh, um, I don't, to be honest, our focus is a little bit more on the electronics and software side of things. Um, Amanda, do you know if the guys in the lab are doing any recent measurements on that kind of stuff with the radar system or anything like that? Um, we, we are, we have some things planned. Um, I don't know how much I can actually talk to them, but 
we we are doing some extensive 22 testing it is in our um it's it's in our scope of work um for the future near future so do, okay. we just have to find the time and the bullets and the <laughs> the manpower to shoot it all so yep we're that is definitely something that ab has in its in its plans good uh yeah, and I suspect if there's anything that's learned out of that that needs to happen to the, the solver situation, like if the 22LR needs modified, like if there's a, some other effect that happens on such bullets that will compensate for that, we'll build that into the solver core and that'll get pushed out. So I don't know that we're necessarily going to see um, any changes, but if there is something, we'll come out with that. That probably, you know, the custom drag models that are implemented on the 22LR that, that, that make that happen. Uh, in terms of accuracy and, and the projections or trajectories. David, I will say that the Bushnell Nitro, that's in my 22 kit. I keep that one, that particular range finder in with my 22. It is great at 22 long range. Um, in that application, it works fantastically. Gotcha. Um, Otis had a question on the AB app for iPhone. How accurate is the wind direction on that? Um, are you, Otis, are you talking about how it can pull from the local weather source? Is that perhaps the, the situation? Um, I'll answer that question and then expand upon that. Um, if, that's the, if that's the question, you know, it, it's taking a sample from the closest weather station. So, however, as you are on the earth, as you know, as the closer you get to the ground, the, the higher the turbulence around the ground is, and you'll see the, the wind directionality is highly affected by local terrain features. And so if you're sampling using the iPhone app, what the crosswind direction is, those weather stations usually give you a report at some height above the ground at some location that's not local. So I would very much use it with caution. I would take a localized measurement with your Kestrel. Uh, I would also then manually drive that direction by clicking on the little guy with the arrows and making sure that the, um, you know, you either set the wind direction, you know, based upon the number of degrees or a clock direction based upon that to, to make sure that you've got it as accurately as possible. Um, from how accurately you should set the wind, I would say, if you're looking at it from a clock direction standpoint, every like 30-ish minutes on a clock direction would be um, accurate enough. Honestly, if you can get the directionality and the wind any better than that, then that's awesome. But the wind, as you know, changes constantly and it's directionality changes constantly. So uh, especially be careful on the head and tail winds. That's when the directionality changes things dramatically in terms of what the the windage prediction is, um, so be careful on that. But I would use with caution the, the automatic measurements in, in any app, uh, not only our iPhone apps. <laughs> Hopefully that answers the question you had in mind. All right, we're, our, we are quickly approaching our one hour mark. Um, did you want to touch on Mike's question about twist rate really quick? Yeah, go? sure. Uh, Mike had a question on twist rates. It seems like everything, you know, knowledge-wise evolved 10 times more in the past several years and people are spending stuff much faster and pushing the envelope. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, you know, one of the things, there was a question earlier, um, I think it was from DK, asked about what are we learning from some of the data that we're collecting? Well, one of the big things that we've been able to characterize is how your spin rate and your spin rate decay affects the ballistic trajectory, you know, predictions and um, how fast you're twisting your gun is definitely uh, you know, played into that. So we, you know, we at the lab have done a lot of work to characterize the trajectory performance of a bullet as it's twisted at, you know, six, eight, 10, 12 twists. That way you can kind of characterize it over several barrels. Uh, and a lot of that work's been done. A lot of it's now, um, 
collected. We have seen a lot of that in the smaller calibers. I say smaller, but what I mean by it, small is not the ELR bullets, but the you know the bullets in the, the 6.5, 308 kind of realm. Um, and that has char been being characterized. In fact, a lot of the work that's being done at the lab right now is on that exact same stuff. So what you'll see from our side, you know, we've talked about how we're improving the state of the art and range finding and integrations into devices, but also the Michigan team is continuing to advance stuff and the accuracy of the predictions of those trajectories. And a lot of that twist rate stuff comes into play. And so over the next several months, if not maybe a little longer, you'll start to see a lot of that data being pushed out from Brian. And then ultimately um, that will make its way into the physical applications themselves, especially that is important when shooting ELR. And that's really where a lot of the focus has been because we're learning a ton of information there. So you'll see all that over a function of time. So in the chat, I added uh, two emails for you guys to jot down support at applyballisticsllc.com. Uh, if you have questions about devices or anything, anything, we get all kinds of questions there. You can um, email that and that's monitored by several of us here at Applied Ballistics. I also added my email address there. You can feel free to use that at any time as well. If I can't answer you, then I will get you with the appropriate AB team person who can. Um, once again, thank you all for joining us. Nick, thank you so much for coming and doing hey, this. Anytime. I apologize for the Amazon music, by the way. That was kind of <laughs> Sorry, we got a weird start, but I'm glad it all worked out after that. So thanks to everybody for listening today. And as always, hit us up if you've got any questions. All right. Thanks, guys. We appreciate you all. All right. Thanks. Later. Bye. Bye.